Hi everyone, um, welcome to my show. It's the festive season, it's Christmas. I hope you like my little friend, um, Fred the Unicorn. He's my Christmas unicorn. <laughs> and by the way, my name is Anita Murjani. And today I wanted to title my show, The Voices Inside My Head. Sorry if that makes me sound crazy, maybe I am. But the show is inspired by somebody who wrote in a question um, on under one of my YouTube videos and she said could you uh, she said she mentioned that she had watched my uh, interview on London Real which was a actually a wonderful guy named Brian Rose he did a wonderful interview where he asked me great questions I highly recommend you watch it later if I get a moment later I will put a link to that interview where um, I revealed that I do get voices in my head. I feel guided all the time. So somebody posted, how can we tune in to the voices in our own heads? Like how, how do you tune into that? So that is the inspiration behind today's show. I've never spoken about this. I only read this question last night. So it's a spur of the moment inspiration. So bear with me because I will be actually thinking out, thinking out loud. So it's very spontaneous and I will be collecting my thoughts as I spoke to you. I scribbled a few notes to help me. Um, and thank you for your comments, Miki Puerto Riki. Happy holidays, Anita. Thank you. And I just saw a comment from someone that's whizzed by where she said, Merry Christmas to Fred as well. See that? <laughs> so somebody wrote to me a couple of weeks ago and said, what is the significance of the unicorn? To me, the significance is that the unicorn is a mythical animal and so people believe it's part of their imagination, whereas I like to think that our imagination is our, um, it's our connection to what's real because something can't become manifest until it's imagined. And our imagination is actually our portal to the other side. It's our portal to our higher self, our voices inside our head. And, and so the imagination is a very important part of us, not something to be buried, not something to be undermined, not something to be told as I was when I was a child, oh, it's only your imagination. In other words, dismiss it. No, our imagination is a very big part of who we are, very important, very important for leading the fullest lives that we possibly can and very important for us to in fulfilling our purpose and in finding our purpose we need the imagination it literally is our portal to the other side so for me the unicorn it it, it symbolizes that because you know it's a an animal that's mythical here but not not on the not in our imagination it's not so uh, that's why i love unicorns but as you know unicorns are extremely popular today um, yes, especially with kids. So it also brings out the inner child in me, which I love. So hence my love for unicorns. Um, Renee Carter, hi. She says, love that Fred's hoofs and tip of his horn color coordinate. Yes, he's like me. I like, I like matching stuff. Like I like matching my shoes with my purses, with my earrings. So I think Fred, maybe it's a female. Hold on. Okay. It just occurred to me. Um, yeah, maybe it's uh, Frederica. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Fred. Yeah, Frederica. Uh, so yeah, I think you're right, Renee. You're onto something. She's got great taste in clothes. But then, you know, who knows? Gender is only a here thing, not a there thing. So gender is not even important at this point. But um, I'm digressing. Today, I wanted to talk about um, the voices inside my head. And... Um, and, and it's a big subject for me because a lot of what I do, so much of what I do is guided by what I call my higher self. It could be my guides, the people on the other side. Um, and I know that they are a lot wiser and um, a lot wiser than the physical me that I am here. And so whether I envision them as being other beings or my own higher self, the part of me, that uh, has lived forever, that has lived, that continues to live after this life, that part of me that knew what my intention was when I came here. Um, I think it's a combination of those things, those elements. 
And sometimes it feels like it's my higher self and sometimes it feels like it's guidance coming from other beings, beings that are far more powerful um, than me and they may have never incarnated as physical beings. But um, I feel guided all the time and I want to talk about how we can access it. And I know that I was born with this guidance system, but it was conditioned out of me. And I think many of you are in the same situation. And particularly if you are super sensitive or you are an empath, uh, you are born connected to this guidance. And, um, and, and what happens is that as we go through life, we get told it's our imagination or we start to give our power to the outer world and we start to suppress our inner world. So here's the thing, in order to get that guidance back, you have to realize that your inner world is real. It is really real and you have to empower it. We tend to empower our outer world, what we can see and feel and see, uh, feel with our physical senses. We think that's the real world and anything we sense inside is not the real world, that it's our imagination. So um, it's actually the other way around. And I see a comment from <clears throat> Helena Lichtenstein. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Years ago, I listened to a guided meditation and my guardian angel gave me a unicorn. Oh, how fun. See, that's the thing. Unicorns, I find, are symbols. Unicorns, white feathers, these are symbols that you are or signs that you're being watched over. So um, what I want to say is that this guidance is not just for a chosen few. It's available for everybody, um, but in order to tune into it, you have to do the work. It's, it's, so it's not like the guidance system, it's not like there's these guys up there or women up there who are thinking, huh, we're going to pick on her, we're gonna, she's going to be chosen, he's going to be chosen and forget about the rest of the people. It's not like that at all. They are sending these signals out to us all the time. And the more we tune into them, the more they send it to us or the more we hear. It's there all the time, but it's our choice how much we want to tune in, how little we want to tune in or not tune in at all. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about how to tune in to those voices, to that guidance system. Debbie Lubinsky, I love your blouse. Oh, thank you. I know I wore this for the festive season. Thank you. She says you're a sparkle in this world. Oh, thank you. Um, I I, I, I try because <clears throat> one of the things I love to do is I love to have fun and I love to make people happy. That makes me happy. Just making people happy is what makes me happy. <clears throat> and, I can't, and I find that I can't stay down for too long because it's not good for me and it's not good for the people around me. So how do we tune in to this, this guidance system? Um, so first of all, um, it's easier for me to talk about how we lose connection with the guidance system. And, um, and so the way that we lose it, so from the time we're young, we're children, we're connected. If you look at your pets, pets like your pet dog, your pet cat, if you look at babies, you look at animals, they are connected because, um, uh, I, I hear stories all the time about when there is a natural disaster, but very few animals are affected because they have been guided to move to higher ground or to move elsewhere. Um, birds are guided. So our animals are connected to that guidance system all the time. And the reason they are able to connect and we are not is not because they're, they're chosen or they're more intelligent. I mean, they could, they could well be more intelligent, yes, but, but it's because we allow things to block the way. We allow things to get in the way, and I call these things filters, filters through which we view the world. These filters are our belief systems. Um, and many of our belief systems don't work for us. They work against us. And we buy into this, these beliefs while we're grown up, growing up. And empaths and sensitive people are the most likely to fall into buying into these 
belief systems because they really want to please everyone around them. They feel what everyone is feeling. They want to please everyone around them. So they end up, and I should say we, we end up giving our power away to everyone around us. So here are the two things, two of the things to watch out for on how you lose touch with that connection with your higher self or your guides. One of them is criticism. When you get criticized, um, you know, one thing is when you're an empath, criticism is blown out of all of all proportion in your own head. I know it is for me. I know it was for me when I was growing up. Criticism feels bigger and it's magnified than what the person means it to be. So when you hear criticism, it's like, like this voice echoing in your head, making you feel I'm bad, I'm not enough, I'm not good. And maybe the person hasn't even meant it that way. Maybe it's a mild criticism, but it gets blown all out of proportion in your head. Um, that's very common for people who are super sensitive. And that's what it means to be super sensitive is that little criticisms really shock you and, and they, they feel so strong in you that what happens is you go out of your way to avoid criticism because of how painful it is. And as you go out of your way to avoid criticism, you start doing things to please people. You become a people pleaser because the last thing you want is criticism because for you it hurts more than it does the average person. And so it's important to understand this because as you go out of your way to please people, you're starting to give your power to everyone around you. You're starting to do what everyone wants you to do or um, what gains you approval as opposed to what your inner guidance system and what your voice is telling you. That's one way how you lose um, power, how you lose your connection with your own guidance system. Um, and I'd love to hear in the comments if you relate to what I'm saying and how many of you are so afraid of criticism that it turns you into people pleasers. You're not alone in that. It did that with me as well. I mean, it does it. I am like that as well. Um, the second thing is when we are, and this is the opposite side, is when we become addicted to approval. So again, people who are super sensitive to criticism, we do whatever we can to gain approval. And so what happens is when somebody gives you approval, you're like, oh my God, that approval was amazing. And then when that approval stops, you're like so sensitive that you go, what have I done to cause them to stop giving me approval? And we become a slave to the approval. We become a slave to that person who stopped giving us approval because we're wondering what did we do wrong? And so we go after them trying to win their approval again, again, giving our power away to the person or outside world. Um, so now just imagine, you know, in your childhood, you've been bullied, maybe um, you've been a victim, you've been abused, maybe, maybe your parents Maybe you weren't lucky and your parents held back on approval. So just think how that kind of messes with you and creates all these different filters through which you view the world. And over time, these filters are what slowly make you lose your connection to that guidance system. And so what I want to talk about is how to release these filters and Michelle Lerner Myers, a comment from you. Thank you. Yes, criticism feels like a punch in the stomach to me. Yep, it does to me as well. And it's for me, it even affects my head. And for some people, um, criticism can make you physically ill. It can make you feel like not going into work. If you received criticism at work, it can make you so physically ill that you feel too sick to go into work. Um, it's, it's not uncommon, but what is uncommon is that it gets addressed, which is what surprises me. And this is what I talk about in my book, Sensitive is the New Strong. It's about recognizing that there are a whole, um, <clears throat> I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people who feel this way. And I know it's a boatload of people because People write to me all the time when I talk about this, like right now I'm talking about it in this video. I haven't found any work or books that talks about how huge criticism feels. But when I talk about it, people are going, yes, I feel that way. I feel that way. So this is what compels me to talk about these things. 
And so the dichotomy though, and here's where we get to the dichotomy for people who are empaths. So on the one hand, as an empath, your connection to your higher world, or, or if you're super sensitive, your connection to your higher world is stronger than someone who is not as sensitive or not as empathic. So your connection is stronger. Your intention to follow that was stronger. But at the same time as an empath, your awareness of the outer world and your pain from criticism is deeper than the people who are not empaths. So do you see what I mean about the dichotomy? In other words, the pain of not following what someone wants you to do is greater than everyone else's, but the calling and the pull of the higher world is also greater. And so this is the challenge. This is the journey of the empath. This is the odyssey. This is what makes us our own worst enemies and also makes us our own best friends. It's when you can follow that higher calling that your life really works out in magical ways. And it's when you give your power away to the outside world. So it's inside versus outside. It's when you give your power to the outside world that you lose your connection to that and your world starts falling down, going down this spiral where you feel, um, you know, I, I actually believe that empaths are more prone to things like depression and even ending their own life. Um, and I'm saying this, it might be out of line because I, I haven't actually done any research on it, but I'm just feeling it for myself that, wow, that is the kind of thing that would drive people to take their own life or to feel depressed or for them to turn to outside means to dull the pain like narcotics or whatever. Um, it's something that I can truly understand as a path for people to escape that kind of pain. And who feels more internal pain than anyone? It's the empaths and the super sensitive people. So my reason for sharing what I share is because I want people to learn how to tune into their inner self. I really want people to learn to do that because that is their salvation. That is their purpose. That is where they can really turn their lives around and to make good of themselves. And those are the voices that I hear in my head. When I lost touch of those voices, that is when I went down the spiral of getting cancer. How did I lose touch with those voices? I lost touch with those voices by listening to the critics. I lost touch with those voices by becoming addicted to approval and so doing everything I could to meet people's approval because that's what I relied on, the approval from the outside world because that's what made me feel good. I gave my power outside of me. Um, today I'm very, very conscious of turning inward and constantly tuning in and that's a little bit what I want to talk about. Now last week I made a video called um, it's money or uh, let's talk about money or something like that but it was about money and uh, in that video if you haven't seen it I'd love for you to see it. I talk about a, a critical email I received from somebody shortly after I had my near-death experience and was trying to figure out how to make money again because I didn't have a job, my husband didn't have a job, and then I received a critical email from someone. Now, for when I look back at that, I gave that critic my power at that time and it took me off my path. And this is what happens when you give your power to the critics, it takes you off your path. Your path is to follow that inner voice. Um, uh, and also when I have received, when people have debunked me for sharing my story, when I get people who are too steeped in material science and when they tell me things like, oh, all those things you, that you experienced, that was your brain imagining things and a dying brain does that. You may have had a spontaneous remission, but it doesn't mean that you actually visited the other side. Those are the tricks of the dying brain. And when you get critics like that, um, what it did was it made me want to stop sharing my story for a while because again, those critics, 
that criticism just reverberated in my head in a huge way. It felt like um, someone had kicked me in the stomach. It felt like um, literally that knives were going through my heart. And so, um, and so my message is if you have, and, and thank you, Nalani Singh Hart has posted, I've relied on people's approval all my life. You see, and this is the thing, this is the dichotomy and the double-edged sword. People who are super sensitive and who are super empathic are the ones who are the most connected to the other side. They are the ones who are the ones who can most heal this planet. And they are also the ones most susceptible to giving their power away so that they lose that connection. So now, um, someone else, Christina, has said, I want to learn how to block all the negative and control my sensitivity or protect it. So here's, and the reason why my explanation is taking so long is because it's very hard to block the sensitivity. You don't want to become unsensitive. And so I'm glad you said that. I'm really glad that's a great thing you said because it takes me on this point is that you don't ever want to block the sensitivity because it is your sensitivity that is connected to the other side. And if you ever block it because you're trying to block what comes in from here, if you block your sensitivity, you block what's coming, coming in from there. The thing is to be aware of what is, uh, of that you are giving your power to the outside world and start giving it to your inner world or to your higher self. So let's see some of the things that I've written down just to get me online, because again, this is the first time I'm talking about it. So I'm literally thinking out loud as I'm speaking. Um, so one of the first things is to ask yourself, what are my filters? And what, are, what do I mean by what are my filters? What are the filters through which I view life? And a couple of things I can ask you to do is watch one of my videos called Dying to Be You, where I talk about how we accumulate filters through our lifetime. Now here's a filter that of mine is, um, one of the filters through which I view life is of victimhood. Because I was bullied as a child and because I was discriminated against, racially discriminated against, because I've been a doormat, made myself a people pleaser and a doormat, the filters through which I view life are, I am a victim of my circumstances. And I'm aware of that now. And when you are aware of it, it stops having a hold on you. And let me give you an example to make it more tangible. But I want you to do the exercise after the video. Uh, uh, when the video is finished, I mean, I want you to go away and identify your own filters through which you view life. So for example, my filter is that I am a victim. Yours could be something like, um, um, I live in a world where, uh, where I have to um, I have to compete with everyone or that there is not enough to go around. And if I don't compete with people, they'll get it before I do. You know, these are filters. That's not one of my filters. My filter is I am a victim and I have, um, and I am resigned to, to doormathood. I have to please people. I am so sensitive that, um, that, that I have to please people so that they don't hurt me. I am. A, and so what this filter does, the patterns that it creates to give you an example is even, let me talk about something in the last few years. Let's say I attended a speaking event where I was a speaker, one of several speakers and there was a guy there who's, uh, who I, I really liked his speech. I thought he was great. And so I um, wanted to speak to him. And yet I found him to be a little bit cold and standoffish with me. And so my immediate filter, and this is what I mean by a filter, what your filter does, my immediate filter said, to, you know, because my immediate filter is the victim doormat filter. It's like, huh you're not good enough. You know, you're just uh, some small person who is a doormat, who's been a victim and racially discriminated. Of course, they're going to look down on you or that person, you know, so I immediately interpreted that person as being condescending towards me and looking down on me. That's how I interpreted their, their action. Later, when I went away, I thought, that was my filter kicking in. And this is what I mean about being aware. Be aware of this pattern that comes up over and over. The minute that I said to myself, 
that was my filter. I made myself aware that was my filter. If I removed my filter, what is it that it could have been? And that's when the voice inside my head, these are the voices I hear, the voice said, that person is a fan of yours and was intimidated by you. They have read, my, read your book, they love your work, and, um, and, and they love your work, and they felt starstruck when they saw you and they didn't know how to react around you. And I was like, whoa, you're kidding me. Now the physical me was like, no way, there's no way I would, my work would intimidate someone. I mean, I'm the small doormat person. That's what my head is saying. That's what my filter is saying. And this is what I want you to identify. That voice, once you identify your filter, that voice is allowed to come through. But if you hold on to your filter so tight that I am that victim, I am that bullied person, I am that doormat, that voice can't even penetrate through it. It's almost like that voice is on another frequency from the frequency of this filter. You have to rise above your filter and go to the frequency of the voice. And that voice will surprise you because it will say things about you and to you that you will never imagine for yourself. Because it wouldn't occur to me to think that. Once that voice said that to me, I thought, huh, I don't believe you. But then I thought, let me try it on. Let me move that filter and let me try it on. That yes, that person is a fan of mine, read my book, loves my work, and was just awkward when I was there. They were not being condescending. They were not being proud and looking down on me. So I went back to that person with that feeling, with that energy. Sure enough, that person was a fan of mine and had read my book and was very moved by my work and, and was quite... Um, in all like to, for us to be talking to each other and it felt really really incredible but that's what I mean so that's what filters do to you and these filters these beliefs you have about yourself is what prevents that voice from coming through so to identify your filters so that's number one your exercise number one is to start identifying what are the filters that are preventing the voice from coming through. And these are the filters that are preventing you from reaching that frequency at which these voices are communicating. Remember, these voices are communicating all the time, but it's up to you to reach that frequency. And if you want more help on that, I spoke about it in my video, um, which is called Dying to Be You. I also speak a lot about uh, buying into beliefs that don't serve you in my book, What If This Is Heaven? Because basically what I'm trying to say in that book is we buy into these beliefs which become our filters and we live a life of hell. When literally when we remove these filters, life could actually be heaven. Heaven is actually here because we have that connection all the time. Those voices are trying to talk to us all the time. And that's what my book, What If This Is Heaven? is really about. Um, so yeah, take off those filters and you can tune in. And we have to do, do the work in tuning into that frequency. So number one, identify your filters and, and be aware of them and disempower them. Don't give them all your power. Number two, um, the second thing you can do is if you're having trouble identifying your filters or hearing the voices, start taking more time alone. Spend more time alone, spend more time talking to yourself. Um, I know talk, people say talking to yourself is the first sign of madness, but I promise you, if I am mad, I would rather be me than a lot of people out there who are considered sane. Um, most uh, of the people who tell you that you have to be realistic and who tell you that what you're saying is unrealistic, um, I have noticed the pattern that they're not the happiest people, but I can't help being happy a lot of the time and in the moments that I'm not happy I just have to turn inward and I hear the voices again and they draw me out again because even recently um, you know things happen all the time when I feel as though people are hurting my feelings all I do is turn inward and I remove those filters and it's not you know removing the filters is one thing but I literally hear the messages. I am not kidding. I literally hear the messages when I remove the filters. So turn inward, spend time alone, maybe at night before you go to bed and ask, ask them, talk to yourself, ask your guides, what should I do? Um, 
And you can also reiterate. So if you have discovered what your filters are, reiterate things like if your filters are similar to mine, if it is that you've lived a life of believing that you're a victim, or if your filter is that I need to win their approval, which is another one of mine, reiterate it to yourself. And um, you can actually say that, that, okay, I've identified my filter. How do I let go of it? Help me, give me the voices. I tell you, once you're willing to step that line and ask for their help and be willing to let go of the filters, you'll start hearing it. So that is number two, really ask them to come in. So number one is identifying the filters. Number two is you talking as if they are there. Whether you can hear them or not, it's you talking. It's you asking them for help. It's you telling them that I am starting to identify my patterns. I'm identifying my filters. These are it. I need approval all the time. How can I let go of that addiction? Please help me. Um, so identify that. Number three is keep a journal. In the beginning, you'll need the journal. You may not need it later on. Um, keep the journal to identify. Number one is to write down these things. Write down, I am a people pleaser. What are the triggers? And this, this will help you to find your, uh, the filters that you operate through. And when you hear the voices, write it in your journal, really write it. Um, and then they're there to remind you. So journaling is really about writing things that come to you and it may come to you in the middle of the night. So I keep something by my bedside with which I can record. I keep my um, either a pad and paper, a pad and pencil, or sometimes it's my iPad so I can real quick speak into it. Excuse me. I try not to keep my phone because my phone tends to be disruptive to my sleep, but I may take my iPad and, and put it on airplane mode so no messages can come in, but it's there for me in case I get up and I need to put something down. So journaling is really important. And then the fourth thing is to make a commitment to trust your inner world to trust your inner thoughts and to trust your inner voice. And, and also very appropriately, I've got a question from uh, Cecil Cecil who says, how do you know if it's the voice of your higher self or your ego? So your ego means your physical self. So the way I know it's the voice of my higher self is that my higher self will tell me things that make me feel good and it's things that I didn't expect to hear. The voice of my lower self or my physical self is the voice usually that comes from fear. It comes from anger. It comes from being a victim. It comes from the filters of my childhood that I've built up over life. The, um, the higher self voice is the one that transcends all of that. It's, the, it's literally like the voice of God or the voice of my guardian angels. It's the voice of my, um, you know, someone who's extremely caring. It's the voice of unconditional love when it, you know because um, criticism doesn't feel like love in that moment you may need to hear it in that moment but in the moment it can be something that weighs you down um, and it may help you moving forward but you need something to take you out of that and that is the voice of your higher self the voice of your higher self will help you to turn that criticism into fuel, into your power, into how to move forward. And that's what's been the case with me. If I stayed with the criticism, I would still not be sharing my story. If I stayed with the debunkers, if I stayed with the critics, if I stayed with seeking approval, I wouldn't be here where I am today. But it's in identifying that, that the way I have taken what they're saying is through my old filters of being a victim, I now have to rise above it. And it's in identifying that, that the voices are able to communicate with me on a frequency that is higher than that of victimhood, doormathood. So you can take that as fuel. And for me, the fuel is that I've taken that and what drives me is helping people who are going through that, helping other people who are victims and other empaths and other people who are super sensitive and people who've been bullied and helping them to know that actually they are the voices that need to be the stronger voices as we move forward. Um, because really 
what's happened is that in staying a victim, in being told that this is a weakness, and in staying a victim, our voices haven't been heard. And I feel that in suppressing that empathic voice, that sensitive voice, in suppressing it and believing that we are the lesser, the world has actually become out of balance. And we've started to live in a world that does often, when we turn outward, it does often feel like a dog-eat-dog -dog world, um, a, f a fight or, you know, um, it's like a might is right. And, and all those things will actually just lead to our own extinction. So remember, the voice that you're hearing is always the gentler voice, and it will never guide you wrong. So number, um, so number four is to start, is to make the commitment to trust that voice over the voice of the outer world. So it's trusting the voice of love or the voice that you're getting inside, which feels like your imagination or your dream. But here's the other key. It feels empowering. It feels good. All of a sudden you'll feel, oh, I get it now. See, that's how I felt when that voice said to me that this person um, was being aloof towards you, not because they were condescending, not because you're a victim, not because they're looking down on you or they're discriminating against you. No, it's the opposite. It's because they're in awe of you. When the voice said that, it was like, oh, it felt amazing. It's like, it's not something I would have thought of. That's what the voice does. It feels like a light bulb moment. And you can have these light bulb moments every day, which is what I experience. Every time as a topic for a video, it's like, oh, I know what people would love to hear next. Oh my God, I know what it is. And I don't know where it comes from, but then I do. It's coming from that voice. That victim me, if I stayed behind that filter of the victim, of the people pleaser, I wouldn't be taking these risks. I take risks and talk about stuff that I wouldn't have dared talk about 10 years ago, eight years ago, because the, as I identify that these are my filters, the voices get stronger. And it's like, and you will end up taking risks when you listen to these voices. And here's the other um, dichotomy or the other thing that happens is when you stop worrying about being a people pleaser and you stop worrying about the critics and you stop worrying about the approval or trying to get the approval and all you do is follow those voices, you actually find um, that you are energized and fueled in such a way, this is what I'm finding, that you will attract um, a group of people who will say, oh, I get you, I get you and you will truly attract the people who are truly your tribe, who get what you're saying, and you will find that you are helping people without feeling like you're helping people. But whereas when you are trying to win people's approval, you, th you think that I just want to help them. That's why I want to win their approval. I just want to help them. But you are seeking your guidance from the outside, and that's how you get drained. When you're seeking your guidance from the inside, it charges your batteries. That's another way of knowing whether the voices are real because when you follow them, it charges your batteries. But when you follow the voice of your physical self, your small self, your ego self, you are trying to win the approval of the people outside, you start to get drained. And that's the big difference. My batteries get charged, supercharged, when I follow the voices inside me and my higher self, not only do my batteries get supercharged, I end up helping a lot more people. So that's really how it works. Um, the, the fifth thing I want to add is be aware of what knocks you out of your frequency. And these are the things that will knock you out. When I say knock you out of your frequency, it means knocks you back down onto a lower a physical frequency as opposed to keeping you on the frequency of hearing the voices. The things that knock you out of that frequency are things like guilt, fear, anger, critics, and seeking approval, or criticism and seeking approval. These are the things that knock you back. So if you want a head start on what your filters could be, try these five. 
if do you view the world to, through trying to view uh, trying to get approval do you view the world through trying to avoid criticism do you view the world through fear are you always choosing everything from a place of fear instead of a place of love do you view the world through anger are you easily angered by things that happen in the outside world things that happen in the news um, things that people are doing are you easily angered do they have that power over you all of these mean the outside world has power over you you have to take that power back if you really want to make a change in the world you have to take that power back and start tuning into your own inner world and remember when you tune into your inner world your inner world helps you because it wants you to thrive it wants you to continue doing what you're doing to help the world and so you'll feel your batteries charged all the time um, and number six, if you keep it up often enough, you won't even need the journal. You will be hearing those voices all the time. And I would love to hear from you when you try this, you know, down the line, as you try this, I would love to hear from you as to how it worked, how it helps. And another thing to keep in mind, how to differentiate between the, um, between your, the voice of your fears and the voice of your filters, let's call it the voice of your filters versus the voice of your higher world. Another thing is that your, the voice of your higher good will never ever make you do things that are hurtful to other people. Um, if sometimes other people get hurt by you doing things that are you, that's a different thing, but it will never have you go out and be dishonest and ro rob and steal or, uh, go out and, you know, uh, physically hurt people, nothing like that. It'll never do things that are illegal or immoral, any, any of those things. Your higher voice will never, ever lead you astray. It'll in fact help you to come out, to find your way out of those things. We only get into those situations because we've lost touch with that higher voice or that those voices in our heads. I hope what I've said is really helpful. Um, I would, it's, I'm going to just, you know, I, I would love to hear your feedback. I love meeting you in person. Um, I would love to give you a hug. I would love to see you at my events. I'm doing a lot of events next year and I would love to see you in them. At my events, we will actually be immersing ourselves into these things that I talk about. We will be in a safe environment where you can be all of who you are. Because one of the challenges I had when I came out of the near-death experience is that I understood all of this, what I'm just telling you. I got back in touch with that higher self, but I saw how easy it was to fall back in to my old patterns. And that's why I needed to move away from my old community and I needed to really discover who I was. And over the years, I have really started to notice what it is. Again, as I said, it's the, it's the criticism, it's the people pleasing that brings us back to our old patterns. And this is why I've started to roll out more retreats where we can spend seven days together in really get feeling immersed in this new way of being and seeing it manifest before us, actually working before us before we go back home. Um, and so it makes us a lot stronger in our own conviction and it allows us to really know the difference between um, our outer world and our inner self. So I want to just go to a couple of questions real quickly. Uh, Edith Ma, hi, that's not a question, but good morning, 5 a.m. in Hong Kong now. Yay, my old stomping ground, Hong Kong. Love it, miss it. Um, I still have a lot of friends out there. So if any of you tuned in from Hong Kong, hi there, say hi in the comments and thanks for commenting, Edith. If we have any fabulous questions, I'm turning to my wonderful husband, Danny. Um, Amy Marie Martin, people please disease. Yes, so many of us suffer from that, especially empaths, especially those of us in this field of wanting to help people. And this is what I wanna tell you is that um, helping people is a wonderful thing to do. It's a wonderful thing, but there is a way that you can help people where it comes from the inside out, which recharges your batteries. And that's what I've been talking about. But if you help people from the outside in and you keep doing that without paying attention to the inside, 
you can become drained. The outside in way is doing it because you want their approval. The inside out way is doing it because it's part of your purpose. It's part of your calling. It's listening to those voices. Um, Lisa Jimenez. Hi, thanks for your question. She says, my friends only call when they need a ride or someone to talk to. Oh God, I, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, but I'm never there when I need someone to talk to. I've cut friends out of my life to keep from getting hurt. I'm alone a lot to avoid the pain of others. So you are a prime candidate to start listening to your inner voice. Um, as you start to become aware. Now here's the, the harder part. We need to become aware that we are part of that equation. I allowed myself to become a doormat. It's not your fault. You know, it's not your fault and um, you don't blame yourself, but just acknowledge, you know, because you were a victim since you were a child, you couldn't help it. You didn't know any better. So don't blame yourself but say, I have the power to come out of it because I am part of the responsibility of what got me into being a doormat. Um, so what you need to do is to say, I am no longer a doormat. Here's a good exercise. I learned this from my friend, Geraldine last night, Geraldine Glass, beautiful woman. She said, take two pieces of paper on one of them, write down what you no longer want to identify as or what you want to let go of. And I wrote, so I would write down, if it were me, I would write down something like people pleaser, doormat, um, victimhood, anything like that. Um, so, so write that down on one piece of paper. On the other piece of paper, write down what you want to welcome into your life. You can write down things like empowerment, health, relationships, um, wealth, whatever you want to welcome, the new you, the you who you see yourself being the you that you want your, you know, the guidance to take you towards. You can even write down my purpose, whatever it is on the card that you want to go towards. And so then what she does is she takes the card where you've written the, what you no longer want to identify as she takes them and she actually sets them on fire. She puts them in the fireplace or over a candle. So that's what I suggest you do. And with the other one, you can carry it with you, put it in your pocket, put it in your wallet, put it in your purse. I thought that was a great um, suggestion. So identify what you no longer want to be and burn it. That's not you anymore. Um, I have a question from Paula Hutt Morgan. Do you have a schedule of upcoming events? Yes, I absolutely do. And I will be posting them on this thread. I am excited about it. Um, my events, if I run through them real quickly, uh, what I'm excited about is the event on the ocean that I'm doing, which is the transcendent power, transcendent power of healing, which is um, part of the Alaskan cruise where I'll be taking people um, through a through a guided, several guided meditations. My friend Geraldine with the crystal bowl sound healing will be joining us to help heal people through music. But what we will be doing is tuning in to the, to the higher voices. We will be in a state of learning to receive for seven full days. You will be learning to receive. You will be learning why um, why you have whatever physical ailments you have, if that's what you have, but it addresses everything, whether it's, whether you're struggling emotionally, spiritually, financially, it doesn't matter. All of them are just symptoms, even physically, all of them are just symptoms of, um, something deeper. And that deeper is what we will be releasing through the guided sound and imagery. I'll be taking you on your own simulated near death experience. So, so, um, being on the ocean is only one of my retreats. I'll be doing another one at Omega, another one at 1440, which is on the, um, West coast. And I will be speaking at a couple of other places. So I will be posting something on this thread and check out my website, anitamurjani.com slash events. Um, and so, I will keep doing these videos for as long as I can. Tune in next week to my next video. And for those of you who've tuned in live, 
Uh, I want you to know, I want you to have a great week ahead, a wonderful Christmas, a wonderful holiday season. And please know that, uh, and thank you for all your comments. People are saying Merry Christmas and hearts and heart right back to you. Merry Christmas right back to you. And I will be back before the year is out. Uh, to talk to you again and I do read the comments. I love your comments. I do read them. Your comments also gives me inspiration for other videos for what you want me to talk more about. So thank you so much for tuning in. Love you all and see you next week. Big heart and Merry Christmas.